Canadian Health Services Research Foundation, CHSR. You say that nice and flowing, but I never spell it. Actually, you know what? CFHI is slightly easier than CHSR. Good afternoon, everyone. Can can everyone hear me? Excellent, excellent. So if I see you nodding off, I will speak louder. If I could just a uh, quick reminder, if you've uh, got your cell phones, if you could um, silence those uh, for the uh, duration of the uh, uh, session, that would be appreciated. I think we've got a really interesting session for you. I'm underwhelmed by the number of people, but I'm hoping that they will continue to come in as, uh, as we get rolling here. But uh, uh, it is 1.15, and uh, we do have a limited time. So um, just uh, I'm going to introduce you to uh, three of our speakers. They're going to be coming up in, in succession. Uh, we're going to have some time at the end, almost half an hour if, if the time goes well, uh, for questions and answers. So I'd ask if you'd hold your questions till the end. That would be appreciated. Um, and just to make sure you're in the right place, this is sifting through the evidence on pay and performance in long-term care, what we can learn from other jurisdictions and sectors, and that's going to be followed up by presentation, um, early results from Alberta's long-term quality incentive program. So uh, if I can segue, um, I'm looking at the uh, excerpt or a slide from a slide presentation recently done by the ministry. and and. If you're not excited about this or you're not concerned about this and you're not really, really interested in this, I suggest that you know, perhaps you should be. If, if I was to say health system funding reform, health-based allocation model, HBAM enhancements, if I was to talk about community quality-based procedures, or how about this one, CCAC outcome-based pathways and reimbursement, would you know what I was talking about? Because really... Martin shaking his head, Martin from the ministry. Um, this is really what, this is, what we're talking about today means for us in Ontario. And the one that didn't come up on that list, but, and we're not talking five, ten years down the road, looking at Martin here, um, you know, we, we, we're talking in the next couple of years. And, and you can add long-term care to this list, and those discussions are already starting at, at tables across the province. So, um, saying that, I'd like to first introduce our first speaker, uh, Stephen Samus. Um, as Vice President of Programs, Stephen uh, has a strong reputation in health research and policy, population health, and evidence informed policy development to improve Canada's health systems and ultimately the health of Canadians. Stephen applies more than 15 years' experience in research, policy, development, knowledge exchange, partnership development, and advocacy in the health sector. Prior to CFHI, he was Director of Health Policy at the Heart and Stroke Foundation of Canada, and he managed research and analysis at the Canadian Institute for Health Information. Before moving to Ottawa in 2000, he was a health researcher and policy uh, consultant in British Columbia, where, among other things, he co-authored BC's Framework for Action on HIV-AIDS. Stevens holds a master's degree in sociology from Simon Fraser University in British Columbia and began his career in health policy and research as coordinator research projects at AIDS Vancouver Island in Victoria, B.C. Stephen. Thank you. The first thing I would say, and thanks to the association for having us here today to talk about uh, pay for performance and long-term care. First thing I would say is to anyone who saw the presentation I gave this morning, I apologize for any um, duplication in the presentation, and I recognize a couple of uh, faces here. So I'll try to move through uh, that pretty quickly. Um, I just wanted to, for those of you who weren't at the morning session, just to give you a sense of who the Canadian Foundation uh, the Canadian uh, Foundation for Healthcare Improvement is. We're really um, all about trying to improve health care in Canada by working with people like yourselves uh, who are running health institutions and health systems across the country and really trying to convert evidence and innovative practices into uh, policies, programs, tools, and through our executive training program through leadership development. I want to speak about that in a second. Uh, we have three goals in the organization, uh, health care efficiency, which is like bending the cost curve, trying to get better value for money in health care, improving patient and family experience, and providing a more coordinated approach to complex health needs. And uh, anyone working in the long-term care sector knows all about that. 
Um, just suffice it to say, we can't achieve any of these goals without working with people running health systems because we don't run any health systems anywhere in the country. So it's really that business of working together, uh, supporting health leaders uh, through the improvement process by which we're able to um, to do this, and we do try. What we try to do is to help those we're working with to measure the extent to which they're making improvements. For those of you who wonder why haven't I ever heard of this organization before, you may have heard of the Canadian Health Services Research Foundation (CHSRF), which we were established as in 1996, and we became the Canadian Foundation for Healthcare Improvement in late 2012. Um, and we started off as a funder of research, moved much more into the application of research uh, with a little bit of granting. And over the last couple few years, we've just completely stopped granting and uh, started to move much more through the change management process, implementation and evaluation of changes in healthcare, and then decided that we would change our name because it more accurately reflected what we were doing. And this gives you a sense of some of the collaborative uh, projects that we have going on across the country. Um, and I would point to a whole series of stuff in Atlantic Canada, a cluster of projects that we have called the Atlantic Healthcare Collaboration, uh, which is about bringing all 17 health authorities in Atlantic Canada together to work on chronic disease management. And uh, that just got underway in November, which we're really uh, excited about and hope will, through working collaboratively, um, actually uh, spread some of the uh, good work that's going on in the various regional health authorities across the region. And through being much more of a um, facilitator of helping them with coaching and mentoring through the change management process on the issues that they're working on, hopefully try to actually change the way that they deliver care, uh, and then helping them to measure the difference that's making in terms of cost, patient experience, and uh, health outcomes. So that's kind of how we're starting to work and, uh, with uh, institutions across the country. And this is the way that we're doing it, largely by going through a process of assessment, uh, helping uh, organizations to sift through the evidence on issues, using that evidence and experience that they have, and, and, and uh, and also being sensitive to their own local context, trying to design the implementation, implement it, go through the change management process needed to implement change, and then hopefully, and this is a role of a national organization, to try to spread some of the good ideas that are happening across the country, and especially if we have the metrics for those uh, changes. So these are some of the questions that we've been asking over the last little while, and they are, they're germane to the topic today. So how can we integrate services better and ensure a more patient and family-centered approach uh, to help Canadians live well with chronic conditions? How do financing models impact health system efficiency, patient experience, and outcomes? How can we best involve patients in improving health care? And what are the essential differences their involvement take? Uh, make and um, how can we get out of the pilot project syndrome that Monique Bejan, former health minister, says we are so prone to in Canada, and actually begin to spread uh, work that's happening across the country? In 2011, we received um, some money from Health Canada to commission a series of syntheses of the evidence on issues, and so we produced 22 reports over about a six or eight month period and we held a series of policy dialogues under what at the time was called the Healthcare Financing and Transformation Initiative. Um, and it was really um, intended to look at some of the major issues around uh, uh, both how, we, how healthcare in Canada is um, financed, managed, organized and delivered. And uh, so we hosted um, a number of policy dialogues with individuals related to that. We also did some work on uh, what we called the Better With Age series, where we held five regional and one national roundtable uh, focusing on uh, how do we deal with the tsunami, supposed tsunami of, uh, law of, of aging in Canada and how do we plan for it. Um, and there really were two key messages that came out of that series of dialogues, which included a lot of people in the long-term care sector. And one of those messages was don't plan for seniors, plan with seniors. And that came out loud and clear with some real ideas about how to do that. And the other thing was that this, this whole idea that the health system is going to be swamped by um, 
by the aging of the population. I saw a clip the other night for the Poseidon Adventure, that old film from the 70s, and you know, there's this idea that the health system is going to become the Poseidon and that the aging population is just going to wash over it. And really, it, that isn't the case. I mean, aging is kind of glacial. It's not, um, it's not immediate. And, but at the same time, we really do need to change the way in which uh, we, um, we finance and plan for health care in Canada, and particularly around, long, around uh, complex care. Which led us to look at some funding models and mechanisms and incentives. And in 2011, as part of that paper series, we commissioned Jason Sutherland and Trafford Crump, who's going to pick up on this presentation, to do an analysis of the impact of various funding policies on ALC patients. And one of the things, and these, that paper is available on our website as well. Bo uh, all of these papers are available on our website, including, including the papers that uh, Jason and Trafford did. And they found that 14% uh, of acute care beds are used inappropriately each day in Canada. And then, so we started thinking, well, if we were to extrapolate that somehow, um, and if the average cost of an acute care bed in, in Canada uh, is, and I think this was taken from Ontario, is about $1,100 a day, and a resident day in Ontario costs about $156, then this would amount to about $7 million a day or about $2.5 billion a year in beds that are, um, in beds that are uh, inappropriately used in the, in the ALC area. And Jason and Trafford recommended a number of things that we, that principally that funding be aligned, that we align funding mechanisms and incentives with policy objectives using activity-based funding and pay for performance, focusing strategies to reduce ALC by discharging patients from acute care earlier to the appropriate setting and reducing demand for future hospital-based care, ensure data reporting systems are integrated and sufficiently comprehensive to match ser services to patient needs, create pan-Canadian evidence-based guidelines and standardized definitions, and emphasize knowledge translation and cross-jurisdictional learning. Um, and we also, based on their work and a variety of other pieces of work that came out of this, we did a MythBuster. The organization has been long known for its MythBusters. So we did a MythBuster on um, activity-based funding leads to for-profit hospital care because that was being talked about a lot. And uh, so that MythBuster is also available on the website. And the other thing that we tried to do is to do a, a brief, uh, a very short policy brief on what if financial incentives were better aligned across hospital and community settings. And again, that's also available. I wanted to just mention we have an interesting project that we're just starting uh, in Ontario now, it, which is a collaboration across four Ontario ministries, uh, as well as uh, Sick Kids and, um, and McMaster. So it's not, um, not long-term care uh, solely long-term care, but it's really in the Ontario Ministry of Health uh, kind of flipped the idea of long-term care and said what we really want to look is a care in the long term and care in the long term for a population that um, ends up in long-term care at times, uh, looking at um, services for youth as they transition into adulthood and they often fall off a service cliff and how do we improve those transitions for youth with complex needs? And at least at the very beginning of the project, to really come up with a common definition and importantly, a common definition across ministries on what we actually mean by complex needs. So we'll be, um, we'll be working on that uh, over the next several months with Ontario. You folks know the, the Canadian long-term landscape better than I do, um, but we've pulled out some data around uh, long-term care in Canada. And it is, just to illustrate what you all know, it's a very, very big uh, industry in this country. Um, and so when we talk about pay for performance, we're talking about something pretty significant. Um, and this is residential care facilities in Canada by ownership type and also in Ontario by ownership type. And you can see they're fairly consistent. And then residential uh, public residential care facilities by type in both Canada and Ontario. And again, a lot of consistency uh, on the resident type mix. Uh, so we know that global budgeting is the norm and that health services are typically funded by a per diem. Accommodation services are generally funded through a resident co-payment. 
there's significant variation across the country. And uh, as we were told at the outset, change is coming and we need to we need to look at that. And then this is just a profile of the long term care funding envelope system in Ontario, which I know all of you know. And this seems to have stopped. Anybody who was at the morning session knows really bad luck with technology and it stopped but I think that's pretty much the end because I'm going to turn it over to Trafford um, the question I had I think at, right after this was uh, the question of so how do policymakers actually deal with um, this large industry the ways in which in, uh, funding comes from the ministry and uh, this important shift this policy shift uh, toward paper performance and particularly funding envelopes that, that follow the patient and the implications of that for long-term care. And with that, I'll turn it over to Trafford. Thank you. So let me just introduce uh, Dr. Trafford Crump, uh, is a postdoctoral fellow working with Dr. Jason Sutherland at the University of British Columbia Centre for Health Services and Policy Research. In this capacity, he has co-authored several papers on hospital and post-acute care funding options, including exploring alternative level of care and the role of funding policies in evolving evidence base for Canada, published by CHSRF, uh, now CHFI, uh, Dr. Crump's portfolio of funded research includes projects evaluating different funding models and the evaluation of care through patient reported outcome measures. He's the co-editor of healthcarefunding.ca and a partial source of information regarding healthcare funding policies in Canada and internationally. Dr. Crump. Well, thank you. That was, uh, that was amazing, Stephen. I love the, the effects uh, kind of like uh, Star Wars or something. I don't know. Unfortunately, we're back to, to plain old uh, PowerPoint, so I have to, to bear with my archaic technology. Um, but as Stephen mentioned, uh, long-term care, not only in Ontario but across Canada, is facing dramatic changes. And uh, uh, many of you guys in, in the room know far better than I the pressures that, the, that are being faced by these providers. Um, but to provide some context to my presentation, I'll just quickly go through uh, this slide. Uh, one, of the, one of those pressures being uh, access to care. Um, and probably this is, this is best quantified by looking at uh, alternate level of care patients or ALC patients. Uh, there's approximately 4,000 of these in Ontario, half of which are looking specifically for placement in, in long-term care facilities. So you're talking about approximately 2,000 patients who, uh, who need long-term care facilities today. Um, the, the, the second major pressure is, is variation in the utilization of care. Uh, Dr. Sutherland and I are doing some work specific to Ontario, looking at different episodes of, of care and the variation in, in their clinical pathways for, for patients. Uh, unfortunately, this work is, is currently ongoing and, and not, not published, but I can share with you uh, one, one specific episode, ischemic stroke, where we've seen almost a two-fold difference in, uh, across the limbs in terms of where patients are, are discharged or patients being discharged into, into long-term care, long care. On a percentage basis, that this may not seem like much, but when we translate it into absolute terms, it, it is quite remarkable. And then the third pressure point, I think, uh, which is a common theme throughout, uh, throughout this conference, certainly in some of the posters I reviewed over lunch, is this, uh, this notion of quality of care and trying to improve that. Uh, the uh, health quality of Ontario most recent report noted that uh, there's been very little year-to-year cha -year change in, in specific quality indicators for, for long-term care. So this has policymakers looking at, at, at the options that are available to them to try and improve uh, these pressures. Uh, and, and it really boils down to, to one of two options, uh, the first being uh, the stick, and uh, this includes things like accreditations, uh, regulations, and even so far as to go as sanctions, and other jurisdictions like in the United Kingdom, Australia, the United States, this actually has been quite successful. Uh, but this is Canada, and we've got to do things a little gentler, got to take things easy, so, so we prefer to look at the stick, or the, sorry, the carrot, 
Um, and, and by this, I really mean sort of the, the financial incentives that we create to try and incent uh, the, the desired behavior. I'll refer to these generally today as, as differences in uh, funding models. So first, I want to start off by, by going through some of the theory uh, behind these funding models. Uh, we'll start with the per diem. As, as Stephen mentioned, this is, this is the most commonly used way that, that long-term care is funded in, in Canada. I won't spend much time but, uh, talking about it, but it is generally used to uh, keep costs below the, the payment amount. There are several advantages to this. I know it's hard to believe because everybody puts down the per diem, but uh, uh, the first is that it is very effective at, at limiting the, the growth in costs. Um, uh, and, and that most of the growth that we do see in costs in terms of long-term care come from the demand side, not necessarily the cost side. Um, it is very predictable for both the payer, that is the policymakers, and the providers, so they can, they can budget accordingly. Every patient is paid the same amount, and um, it's easy to administer, very straightforward. Now, some of the disadvantages, of course, is, is that it perpetuates this notion of silos of care because, of course, long-term care uh, providers are only concerned about the care that's uh, delivered within their walls uh, under this, this kind of funding model. There, are, there is no, transition, uh, no incentives to transition parents, uh, patients to less, in, uh, less intensive care. In fact, uh, there's, there's almost a perverse incentive not to transition them because as patients get better, um, they become less uh, costly to care for and uh, therefore uh, um, demand less resources and, and, and let's keep them in because we're making greater margins on them. Um, and then finally, uh, it doesn't really promote efficiency or, or quality. Now, the hot, the hot issue right now is activity-based funding. Uh, this is uh, incredibly popular across Canada, no matter where we go. Um, this also cause, comes under and serves under a number of different monikers, uh, patient-focused funding, payment by results, patient-centered funding, uh, prospective payment, <clears throat> number of different uh, monikers. And this is essentially very similar to a per diem, except the, uh, the rate is, is adjusted for the clinical complexity of care. Uh, derived largely through the, the RIE data uh, that leads to um, a designation of, of resource utilization groups and uh, uh, payment is, is adjusted uh, according to, to that. Now the advantages to this model is, is that it does actually promote uh, transitions to less intense settings because as, as a patient becomes less complex, uh, the provider earns uh, less money for, for, uh, for that patient and therefore has some incentive to, to usher them into less intense settings. Uh, this can encourage more efficient delivery of care, and it can also reduce the, um, the growth in the, in the cost of care, much like the, much like the per diem. However, it is an incredibly complex administrator, as we'll see uh, in a few slides from now. It requires um, an enormous investment and time spent in, uh, in measuring outcomes and uh, uh, the technology to capture and collect data and report data. And it also, much like the, the per diem, perpetuates these silos of care. Uh, pay for performance, which, is, which was talked about, uh, um, it is often confused with activity-based funding, but I want to stress that it is not activity-based funding. Pay for performance uh, is much different. It is a lump sum payment for meeting specific targets that normally are associated with uh, quality or performance, such as uh, reduced rates of, of pressure ulcers. Uh, the, ad the advantage to this uh, model is that it uh, promotes achieving targeted outcomes, that is, those, those specific quality indicators that are targeted tend to, tend to improve. Um, it rewards those who do hit their targets and, and actually deliver on, on, uh, on those performance measures. And it is, pretty rel it is relatively easy to administer because th these pr indicators tend to be pretty straightforward and, and there's not some complex long algorithm to try and figure out. Um, it requires, however, that investment in, in outcomes measurement. It also per perpetuates these silos of care. And there are no, doesn't really incent anybody to, to move uh, patients into other um, less intense providers. Now, hot off the presses, this is, this is like cutting edge, um, is, is a notion called bundled payments. And, and you may be hearing about this in the coming months and years ahead. Uh, 
this is actually a single payment made to a provider to cover the, uh, a patient's entire episode of care, and this may include a, a post-acute uh, post window. So, for example, a, a patient comes in for uh, a knee replacement, and uh, the hospital is paid for not only the, the surgical procedure and, and any inpatient stay, but also the, the rehab and um, any other post-acute care that is provided. Uh, now, there's the advantages of this is that, is that it, pr it promotes a continuity of care because um, different uh, providers have a mutual financial interest in ensuring that the cost of care is, is kept low. It encourages, um, this encourages a more efficient and, and a higher quality of care, and it minimizes the, the clinical pathways that we see patients taking. Um, however, it is, it is incredibly difficult to administer and it may limit some, um, uh, some, some access to post-acute care. You can imagine like hospitals then have to contract with, with long-term care providers. And, and if you happen to live in a rural area where your hospital doesn't have a contract provider, well, you may be out of luck. Um, and then it may reduce autonomy to some long-term care providers. If, if the hospital is earning dollars based on the quality of care that's being provided in long-term care, well, they're going to want to have a say in, uh, in the care being rendered in that facility. So that was the theory. Let's, let's focus now more on the, on the reality and, and, and what the evidence has to say. Um, I'll, we'll forget about uh, per diem for now, and we'll, we'll focus more on ABF. Um, well, it's been used in, in the United States since 2002. It's generally, and, th and that is really the only jurisdiction where we've seen it used, aside from some one-offs here and there that haven't been well published. Um, the evidence suggests that, that the cost efficiency gains may be totally offset by the administrative, the, gr the growing administrative costs. You'll recall earlier I said ABF is, is, in co is incredibly complex to manage, and, and, and here we see the evidence of that because nurses spend their time collecting RI data, trying to figure out which payment or which patient is earning what payment and, and how the complexity factors into their budget next year. Um, the evidence is quite frankly mixed in terms of whether or not this has any impact on the quality of care. There may be some indications that competition does improve uh, uh, some quality scores, but this is, um, this is, this is restricted to uh, different ownership models, and, uh, which, which may play, play an effect on, on, those, um, on that evidence. Pay for performance. Uh, it, this is this is difficult to say. Uh, this is difficult to evaluate because P for P really it, it's not a it's not in and of itself an, its own funding model. It actually is an adjunctive model to say per diem or or ABF, and so to isolate its its effect um, in 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 the larger scheme of things is 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 really challenging, and so I don't know if we can really say that P for P has a direct effect on quality or performance improvement. Um, it's been used in the U.S. since the 1990s, and really only in the U.S., although to a certain extent it has been adopted uh, more recently in the U.K. and to a certain extent in, in Australia. Uh, the, the programs that have been published uh, tend to be short-lived, and uh, few have been rigorously evaluated. And I know from... Uh, can, some Canadian standpoints, we like to cons we, or we consider ourselves to be way behind the times in terms of P4P. Uh, but the most recent inventory I could find indicates that there are only nine states in the U.S. who, who, who have adopted or are considering adopting pay for performance to, to reimburse long-term care. So it's not like this is epidemic and Canada is trying to, trying to catch up. Um, and the reason for this is probably because there is a, just a dearth of evidence to suggest that it, P4P has any beneficial effect whatsoever to, to quality uh, improvement. And a lot of work needs to be done in this area. Um, as I say, it, trying to do this work, however, is, is very, very challenging and, and, and incredibly difficult. Uh, bundled payments, well, the reality is, as I say, this is hot off the presses. And, and literally, as we stand here, people are down in the states trying to figure out how they're even going to roll this out. Uh, so there is no empirical data to support this whatsoever. It is, it is purely pie in the sky. Um, however, there are two programs that I'd like to highlight that perhaps offer some hope. Uh, PACE in the U.S. and SIPA in Quebec. 
these are integrated programs. I don't. I, 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 I by no means want to suggest that these were bundled payments, but they they sort of acted in the spirit of um, of, of what bundled payments might be. Uh, Pace in the states was was targeting elderly patients um, that lived in, in that lived in the community, and they they, they reimbursed uh, providers with a single payment aimed at, at, at uh, covering the cost of care for the patient for an entire month. And uh, what they've found is is that that has reduced facility-based costs and, and actually improved quality. And I think the general consensus is that this has uh, been a largely uh, successful program that is ongoing in, in the states. The SIPA program in Quebec um, was a randomized control trial that was conducted in the in the earlier 2000s, and it too provided um, providers with with a single payment to cover the entire cost of care for a patient, and it led to uh, lower facility-based costs, um, and actually a surprisingly like 50% reduction in ALC occupancy. That's crazy. Um, and however, there was and and this is to be anticipated a higher community-based cost because instead of treating patients in facilities, they're treating patients in the community. Um, this program is perhaps not totally generalizable to, to the rest of Canada. Quebec has a very unique health care system where its social services and, and uh, health care and mental health are, are sort of all wrapped under one umbrella and far more integrated than what we see in the, in, uh, uh, the English-speaking provinces. So in conclusion, um, I think it's pretty clear that the pressures on long-term care are, is bringing about change. And as Eleanor is going to speak about, that change is already underway in Alberta. And uh, we know that um, L- HBAM is being set up to, to drop into LTC anytime. Um, the funding models may offer a, a, a source of improvement for quality and performance, but the evidence is certainly very, uh, very tenuous in this area. And, and, and if you guys wanted to push back on me on that, that point, you, you, you would be on, on, on sturdy ground, that's for sure. And I think ultimately uh, there is no silver bullet. That is, the, the, the solution will probably be some kind of hybrid, uh, P for P coupled with ABF or bundled payments coupled with a global budget. Um, it's going to be a combo of these things. It's not going to be one single solution. So your takeaway points is that the change is underway and, and successful organizations will adapt. Um, Eleanor is going to talk about uh, uh, bringing about a a cultural change. Um, I I highly recommend that you prepare for measurement because all of the, uh, if if there's one theme that all of the funding models have in common, it's that they rely heavily on on measurement. And and there's some great resources that I can point you to down in the States. It's put together by the Commonwealth Fund and and CMS uh, uh, called America's Nursing Homes. And then finally, I think you'd be wise to, to understand and, and learn about these funding models because ultimately uh, knowledge is power. And uh, uh, this is where I put in my little plug for, for our, our, our website at UBC, which is impartial and, and we provide some introductory materials in, in, in plain language about what these, uh, what these funding models are and how they work. Thanks very much. Elmer Risling is the director, Integrated RI Initiatives with quality uh, information ma- with the uh, quality information management projects and evaluation unit of Primary and Community Care Alberta Health Services. Did I get that right? <laughs> In this role, Elmer has oversight for use of the RI 2.0 assessment instrument and quality initi- initiatives resulting from the outputs of RI 2.0 in the facility living sector of Alberta. Eleanor is a graduate of the University of Alberta's Faculty of Nursing and has been practicing in the area of long-term care in a variety of capacities for the past 20 years. Prior to assuming her current role, Eleanor was the project manager uh, for the Continuing Care Systems Project and the Pathways Waitlist Management System in the Edmonton Zone. Eleanor. Thanks, John. And thank you to OLTCA for having me. Um, So I'd like to walk you through Alberta's journey towards pay for performance and um, our long-term care funding model. 
Um, so I'm, what I'd like to do is just walk you through our journey, um, how we started with the patient care-based funding model, and then outline our steps towards pay for performance. But before I do that, I think it's important to provide you with some context from an Alberta perspective. Um, we, in 2008, we were a province with nine health entities. Um, we have since, in 2008, um, Alberta Health Services formed, which is a regional, one regional health authority. So we are one throughout the province. But the province has gone from nine reg former health entities to five zones. Um, when we were nine, we had nine different established business processes for everything. Now we are moving to one common throughout the whole province. So this is a picture of the um, province and the locales in which we have long-term care centers. And for the purposes of today, I'm only talking long-term care. Um, long-term care in the province of Alberta, we have 174 long-term care centers. We have approximately 14,614 beds. And long-term care is what we see, we're, we're moving in a new direction. Long-term care is the ICU of the continuing care system. So only those clients with, um, that are medically unstable and medically complex should be in the long-term care system. Others uh, are provided care in the supportive living 3, 4, and 4D streams. Now that's in transition, so some communities are, have more capacity for SL 3, 4, and 4D than do others, but we're moving in that direction. And so long-term care um, has 24-hour on-site RN coverage for assessment and treatment. Additional professional services are provided by the LPNs as well as allied uh, health professionals, and our personal care support team is provided through health care aides. Case mix in continuing care, um, pri well, from 86 to 2009-10, we used the Alberta con Resident Classification System, the ARCS grouper, and the case mix me measurement weightings. Um, ARCS, as you're probably well aware, it is done annually. And so what we saw always was this flurry of activity prior to classification where everyone focused their energies on care planning to try and maximize their gains so that in the sense that we wanted to ensure that we, that everybody are, or that the classifier saw the intensity of the workload that we were facing and challenges we were facing with our residents. Um, we started to do rye in the province with around 2005, 2006, and Margaret is in the audience. You were one of the early adopters. What year did you start? Do you know? I think it was 2003. Yeah, so we had a few early adopters in 2003, 4, but really our push started around 2006, and we had the full province up by 2008. Um, April 1st, 2010, we transitioned to patient care based funding in long term care. Why was there a need? Well, there were significant equity issues. There were differences between the zones as to how care centers were funded, as well there were differences within zones, um, how one care center was provided funding or the amount of funding one care center was provided as compared to another. In fact, there was a fourfold difference in funding between some sites depending on location and past business practices. That's huge from an operator perspective. So we said, mm -mm, we have to have equity. Um, we, <clears throat> we wanted to see that there would be a closer alignment between client needs and services. We needed a fair, equitable system. And we needed to standardize our business practices across the province. So we wanted to look at reporting requirements, quality indicators, and financial accountabilities. We, this is work in progress, because as I said, we went from nine to one, and that's a huge transition. This is um, a schematic of our patient care-based funding model. Without going into the details per se, it's based on the three, or on the pillars um, or principles of respect, accountability, transparency, and engagement. For the operators, um, the model doesn't require any additional data collection beyond that associated with completion of the RIE and routine reporting. Our goal is to have um, all of the data from the, we, we don't have our care centers submit directly to CIHI. 
they submit their data to what's known as the Alberta Continuing Care Information System. And that data will in turn make its way to CAIHI, hopefully sometime this year. Um, but at this point, it's, it's housed within Alberta. Um, eventually, ACES will be our source of information for this. In the interim, we have been, we're getting direct reports from the vendor systems to inform our PCBF team as to what the RUG and census data is for each care center. Um, and so that was really important. We didn't want to introduce additional workload burden, which you mentioned, um, to our staff. From an accountabilities perspective, there are built-in accountabilities um, to disincentive or to counter disincentives associated with funding drivers. So occupancy is an accountability for beds, and funded work hours are there is an accountability for funded work hours. To minim which establishes minimum staffing patterns, um, the ratios of professional to non-professional staff mix, and actual worked hours. Um, additionally, just in the design of the funding formula itself, there were numerous consultation sessions held with our stakeholders. We included the Alberta Continuing Care Association, the ministry, and the operators. So in this case, we're a little different in that um, the ministry doesn't drive it necessarily operations. We, Alberta Health Services, there's a difference between Alberta Health, which is the ministry, and Alberta Health Services. And in this case, we are the people that operationalize how we disperse funding. Um, in the Alberta context, it's, I think it's in any context really, but PCBF reallocates existing funding based on care provision of, to clients. The size of the pie does not change. The funding pie does not change. And this is a, a really important point in that um, when we hear, and I know um, this morning, Dale, you mentioned the, uh, some of the flyers that come out, maximize your rug scores. It's, it's an important message. You know what? If you game the system, you're not helping anybody. Because the pie hasn't changed. The funding, the, the amount of money out there hasn't changed. Um, the funding formula is right now in place for long-term care, and the team, the PCBF team, is currently working on designing a, fun, a similar funding formula for SL3, 4, and 4D, as well as acute care environments in Alberta. So... It's built on the concept of two main aspects, which um, Trafford already alluded to, too, is we group clients with similar acuity and resource use using our rugs for, um, from the Rye. We use the 44 grouper in Alberta. And then we set prices to each of those groups, which is the CMI. So PCBF determines allocations between providers or the slice of the pie that each operator will receive. 85% of the funding is based on weighted client days, and essentially what that is is the number of clients in a care center times the number of days times the rug CMI for that particular client. Um, we use RI 2.0 in the long-term care sector and RI HC for the supportive living environments. Um, the other thing is we use index maximized CMIs in our calculations, and every year in April, we reset the CMI table. So we look at the weightings of, and the distribution of rug scores provincially, and we go back and the guys in PCBF do this, but they apply their mathematical algorithms and they come up with new rankings and new CMI scores for each category. We've also included in that PCBF funding formula some special provisions uh, to permit, because we have a lot of small care centers. So any care center that's under 38 beds, there are special provisions incorporated into the funding formula that allow for 24-7 RNs and meal breaks are funded. Um, we have a minimum of two staff on 24-7 to accommodate for lifts and there are, is an allotment assigned for director of care hours. In addition, we put deliberate, um, there's deliberate attempt to increase or provide extra funding for such things as outbreaks, renovations, um, 
we fund the first and the last day of the length of stay. So regardless of the time that the client uh, was admitted or was discharged, both of those days count into the client weighted days calculation. We also incorporated two placeholders in our 44 rug grouper. We have two additional placeholders known as a BC1 and a BC2 category. BC1 is equivalent to a PA1, the lowest CMI, and BC2 has a value of about 1.2, so higher than the average, provincial average. But what we have said is that for the first 15 days that a client is in the care centre, there's usually an additional workload burden associated with having that client you're, you're climatizing them to the environment. There's sometimes, you know, additional work that's involved in settling that client. There's the additional documentation, the assessments, et cetera. So we are willing to, and we are saying we acknowledge that, we're going to give you a little additional funding for that 15-day window. Then when your, your RIA assessment is done, which occurs day 15 from PCBF, 14 from the Kai High perspective, um, on that day, the new assigned rug score comes into play. And we have also funded five-day turnarounds. So we're saying from a time of discharge to a time of admission, we will continue to allocate some funding to you to allow for that turnaround, but five days should be sufficient for you to move a new client into your bed. So that's enough said on the funding formula per se. If you wish to have more information on our funding formula, please um, refer to this website, just go to albertahealthservices.ca in the search, type in activity-based funding, uh, it's still under that title, and uh, you'll come up with the document, a summary document. But I was asked to come specifically to talk about our quality component. And um, the quality component is part of our patient care-based funding model, but it isn't the pool of money, the pie, this is separate from the pie. So we have additional funding that has been injected into the system to provide for quality. <clears throat> so we wanted to look at, we had a desire to incentivize quality care. And our approach in when we were considering pay for performance was to conduct a lit review first and see what was happening. Um, we commissioned a consulting firm from the United States, uh, Myers and Stauffer, uh, to prepare an overview paper on quality incentives and pay for performance. Um, based on that information, we then conducted an environmental scan, selecting key experts um, based on their involvement in pay for performance programs and our quality initiatives and, and measurement in long-term care. And so what we did is we conducted three interviews. And as Stafford, or Trafford um, alluded to, we had to go to the states to really look at what programs were in place. And this is, just shows you the programs that we, we consulted or we looked into. Um, our first group was interviews with individuals from these, these different states. And we focused on the quality incentive models, uh, the resources required to support and maintain those types of programs, what were the key learnings that they had come out with, their, what was the response from stakeholders, as well as what were their measures of success. We then took another group of academics and said, from your perspective, how do we use uh, quality indicators to inform quality initiatives or quality incentive models? What were the lessons they had learned? What was the potential for public reporting? And how would we um, select QIs using what would make sense from a selection perspective for using quality indicators. Um, our third group of interviewees actually came primarily from Ontario um, because we knew that you and we're sort of on alignment with where we're heading. So we selected a group of individuals from Ontario and we um, asked them for their thoughts regarding quality initiatives to inform or quality indicators to initiate uh, to inform quality initiatives and or quality incentive funding models. On the basis of that, what we found is that most programs were voluntary. Um, most define quality as a combination of clinical and system measures. A lot of the programs in the states particularly use such things as staff turnover, staff retention, occupancy, uh, deficiency-free surveys, 
resident and family satisfaction and MDS quality indicators as their tools or as their indicators that they built into their pay for performance um, systems. Most included some form of a per diem reimbursement. It was usually a percentage or a dollar amount assigned to the per diem rate. And the funding allocation, uh, most determined that the funding allocation was either a sum or a weighted sum of a variety of those measures. Um, the quality clinical measures typically were RI quality indicators. And most of them, well, in all cases, they were risk adjusted. <clears throat> so we then said, okay, having, what are the strengths, limitations? Basically, we did what Trafford did. He outlined the advantages, disadvantages of each of the programs and we, to weigh which was the desired approach. We saw these things as challenges. The workload burden for data collection as well as workload burden um, for evaluation reviews, especially if we were to go with a recognition or award type of program. Um, staffing, again, provincial, different business processes, consistency of definitions, we didn't have it at this point, and the HR supports both by the operators um, as well as the degree of automation that a lot of our operators, our standalone operators had with respect to human resource uh, data wasn't consistent. So we said that's going to be an additional workload burden, probably not the best avenue to start on at this point. MDS, we didn't have information about our data quality because we weren't submitting at the time and our risk adjusted QIs were not yet available to us. They've just come to put into play now uh, through our ACES system. So we went forth to our steering committee and said, here's our recommendations. We want to, um, the financial incentives should encourage investment in better care. We want to see a graduated bonus to ensure poor, poor performers step up to the plate. So in year one, everyone got a really small amount. In year two, we said, no, now you have to provide some evidence or you have to do some work to get that quality bonus and we're building on it, and we see that that amount that, that's available to the operators will increase as we have more uh, definitive indicators or objective um, and quantifiable indicators. Um, we were looking for predictable and achievable incentives, yet there had to be a stretch. So it wasn't a, a, a free-for-all. If you submit something, you get the money. We wanted to see that operators had to push and do something in order to achieve um, the, or to receive the allocated amount. We wanted to minimize unintended or negative consequences like gaming or con having centers concentrate or focus their energy on one particular area while ne neglecting others. Um, we wanted to ensure it was a transparent process and we wanted to have it be sustainable, yet flexible enough to change from year to year. We wanted to involve stakeholders um, in the system design and implementation. And Margaret, you're a part of our committee in the de determination of, and Margaret works for Rivera. So there we engage those stakeholders in our, our committees. Um, we wanted to ensure that the measures be credible and have research based wherever possible, so use of the RI quality indicators will be where we're heading. Um, we wanted to address a broad band of quality issues. We wanted to look at the potential for public reporting down the road and or inclusion of some of these items in our seniors' health dashboard. And we wanted to equip providers with methods and tools to improve performance because we know dollars are not enough. We have to also provide the tools. So one of the, one of the ways we've done that is we've supplemented um, this program with opportunities for education um, through the Alberta Improvement Way, which is available to all AHS and contracted operators. It's really a toolkit kind of teaching the tools and methods of quality improvement uh, to root cause analysis. So our, this is our plan. It's three phases. Uh, we want to start with process quality improvements, then move towards more objective, quantifiable, outcome driven, and then we'll look at an awards recognition program down the road. It is available to all long term care sites, regardless of ownership. It's voluntary. We do give a standardized application template. It is a site response. We do not accept corporate responses. So we're really trying to instill that we want grassroots involvement in the determination of quality initiatives. For 2011 and 12, we based it on five indicators. The first year, 
Um, the first one was an implementation plan for conversion from wraps to caps. And why we chose this one was because um, when PCBF came in, all of a sudden RAI became a funding tool. And we wanted to go back and say, why did we inst institute RAI? It was for, to enhance or to support clinical decision making. And in order to do that, we wanted to refocus those energies, put the caps back into play and say care planning is what you need to be focusing on, not PCBF. Um, it also pushed the envelope for some of the vendors because they didn't have the functionality in their systems. But because not every, all the vendors met the requirement, we had to have the implementation plan of quality improvement initiative also. Um, we focused on, they, got, they could receive 35% for the first one, uh, 25 for um, med rec and standardized med review processes in, pl in place and 20% for immunization rates and, and for residents and staff. So there you see our 2011-12 was 2.2% of the actual operating budget was available to the care centers if they met the criteria. Um, the quality initiatives that came through fell into these categories. Um, and you know what, it was, they were basic. This year, we have, I'm seeing transition already, or transformation in some of how those people are, they're starting to use the data. They, this was really generic types of quality initiatives. Next year, or this year, the current year, we're seeing a little bit better um, design. Distribution of funds for the first year, you can see that about 18% received 90% or more, 18% received 50% or less. So there was a stretch there. Not everybody got the money. Um, this year we are focusing on initiatives, quality improvement initiatives using RI 2.0 data at the site or zone level. Again, trying to incorporate or get people to use the data of RI, track, trend, do root cause analysis. They have to provide evidence of improvement this year using the outputs of RI, otherwise they will not um, be assigned the 25% available for that QI initiative. Uh, accreditation status and influenza, or influenza immunization rates uh, are still in it, 25% for each of those. And this year, because we're not looking at objective, quantifiable data yet, our steering committee said, no, we're leaving it at 0.2%. Next year, hopefully, we'll be looking at upper quartile performance based on ri selected risk-adjusted QIs. Um, we probably, the continuing care health service standards as of this week are going to be delayed, so it'll probably move forward a year. Um, but we may, we'll probably still focus on quality initiatives at the site and the provincial level. We have a current, our um, seniors health strategic clinical network is engaging on a project on appropriate anti um, utilization of antipsychotics that will go provincial within this timeline. So that'll probably be what drives a portion of that if people participate and we're trying to reach 21% on that quality indicator. But what will be the actual dollar amount? We're not sure. And we, but we expect it will go up. So just, in, just to reemphasize what Trafford was saying too, this is a combination. Um, we also do long-term care reporting requirements and we're trying to standardize our quality reporting across the zones to provide comparative feedback reports, et cetera. Um, here we're looking at our three pillars of access, quality, and sustainability, and we look at things like ER admissions, um, looking at adverse events, um, outbreak reporting, et cetera. So this is more for tracking and trending, but also sharing and, and giving that information back to care centers so they know where they stand in, comp in comparison to their colleagues. Our aim is really to create a quality culture. We want to integrate RI output standards and feedback into the organizational processes to improve the quality of care and services. Um, our goal is really, it's a transformation. We don't think that you can just incentivize quality. It's got to happen, and we want, as I said, we want that grassroots. We want that local unit level determination. Get the, get the feedback or get that, those people involved so that they buy in and they determine what is the project they want to work on. How do you use data to support? What is your evidence? Get that evaluation going. Um, as I said, we're on a journey. My time's almost up, but we are on a journey. The train has left the station. I don't think we've reached our destination yet but we're on track. Um, it's not all roses. Um, 
you know, there's been bumps, there's been hurdles. Uh, the no loss provision has come off for our AHS owned and operated sites. So they're starting to have to now deal with how do I work within my means. Um, the private voluntary operators still have a little bit of a window of opportunity to, the no loss hasn't been removed from them yet. But it's, I think we're heading down the right track. It's um, definitely, it's made people more cost conscientious. Um, we're seeing changes in our flow of residents in the province who's coming into long-term care and who's, who's not. And honestly, for the first time in my history in long-term care, we're seeing situations now where we don't have clients on wait lists for long-term care. In two jurisdictions right now, we have empty beds or we're, we're having operators say we can't fill our beds. You don't have enough clients to send us and we don't. So that's the transition of what's happening in the province as a result of our initiative. So thank you very much. If you want any more information about activity-based funding or where we're at, uh, please don't hesitate to contact me. That's great. So uh, we're going to open the, uh, the floor to questions, and um, feel free to, uh, to direct them. If you could try and uh, speak up, I'll try and uh, facilitate by repeating the question. Uh, we're, I understand we're, we're recording the session. Um, and uh, so if you'll bear with me as I try and interpret your question uh, for that purpose. Um, if I could, could, could prompt you by saying, I mean, are we ready? Are we ready for this? Are we ready for these changes? Are we ready to be funded, um, at least in part, based on quality? You know, are we, are we ready to, to measure these things? Are we ready um, really for, for, for the challenge? So I'll put it out to the floor for questions. Um, just with respect to when we uh, award the uh, funds, they are no strings attached. You do not have to report back to us how you spent that money. Um, the intent is that you reinvest it in a quality initiative for the coming year. But we recognize that doing quality work or in any quality initiative program costs money. So the intent is you use that money and reinvest it in your care centre. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Dale? Um, hi, Eleanor. Hi, Dale. <laughs> <laughs> My question is, as you go through this reform, and I, I realize that you're doing long-term care, but how are, are you doing the same with other um, health care sectors, whether they do care? Yeah, the intent... doing care? Is this all becoming one? The, yeah, we're trying to integrate as much as possible. Um, the patient care based funding model as it was displayed there, they're trying to use the same template for supportive living environments and you know, there, I mean, there'll be some modifications but um, the patient care based team is trying to use more or less the same template and approach. So in supportive living we're, we're looking at quality initiatives too. So you're using the RIDAD and the RIDAD as well? Yes. So No, 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 the weightings will not, the CMI or the weighting value will not be the same. Um, and and that's, that will be interesting, I think, <laughs> have me back in a year or two and we'll talk about that one because I don't know, uh, we're using the RUG HC in the supportive living environments. Um, that was a decision made many years ago. Um, yet, who are we seeing in that SL4 category today? Those are the clients that used to be in long-term care. They used to be your lighter. You know, when we think of the ARC system, they were your, well, what would you say, CDs? E's even. E's. They are in supportive living now. So, 
it'll be interesting to see whether the home care instrument adequately measures that. We, we, I will say too, there are a few specialty cohorts within long-term care that aren't adequately being, um, that the workload associated with them isn't adequately captured with the RI 2.0 and we're taking those populations out and specialty funding them, but looking for alternate means of how we can do it using a similar system to RUGS. Um, our ventilator units, um, the brain injury, mental health. We have some facilities that are exclusively mental health clients, but they're long-term care. So, and young adults is another area that we're finding. And it's primarily behaviors that we're seeing isn't adequately captured, the workload associated with some of those behaviors. In, that, in those populations. That's right. uh, Trafford, Stephen, have you seen that uh, in any of your studies as well, or research, or other jurisdictions? Um, well, in the U.S., we've, we've looked at sort of these cross-sector uh, and the use of activity-based funding. Um, I mean, they have different names, obviously, for their continuing care sectors, but this is reported in the in the paper we did for the CHSRF. Um, the uh, that that that. When you when you when you apply this activity-based funding across the sectors, and and this applies mainly to the U.S., where where of course ownership is is sort of uh, uh, across the spectrum of, of continuing care, that they do a very good job of um, I don't want to call it gaming because that might put a negative spin on it, but ensuring that the patient is in the area that that best maximizes the dollars available. Um, so. Uh, as that patient is, uh, it, as that patient's complexity changes, they transition that patient in and out of different facilities and different types of care. Yes. If I understood the Alberta model correctly, I think it's the application process for the quality funding. Can you speak a little bit about the review of those applications, <laughs> the structure of that A, and then B, is there a plan in the future to move to um, I reviewed all of them last year. <laughs> um, we don't have a lot of resources. I was with Seniors Health um, and part of the clinical compliance team. And as the overseer of Rye, it ended up being that that became my job. Um, although the other members of the clinical compliance team, you know, said they would assist, it ended up that. I had to review all 174. It, I would say on average it took me about 15 minutes per um, per application to review. Um, going forward, yes, when we get, well, I don't know that we'll get to an automated, but it will be more objective. Um, because we were on proce working on process initiatives right now, um, and some of them were like action plans for, we, get, we granted it. There was a liberal um, allocation, but come the, down the road, it'll be a, less subjective, more objective, and I think it'll expedite the process. The, you know, the immunization results are easy to pull, and you either meet the target or you don't. So that was easy, but it was the process items that were labor-intensive to read through all the documentation. And we tried to really, the template was small. Like we did not want a whole bunch of supplementary. We didn't want Gantt charts and your whole implementation plan. We said, condense it. Tell us the goods. What, what have you learned through, you know, what are your objectives? What did you do? And what have you learned through this experience? <clears throat> Well, or do you think it's just a change in severity? No, I think it's, it's because we're increasing capacity in the supportive living okay. sector now. Mm -hmm. And you're funding that? We are funding it, but residents or clients in supportive living pay differently than they do in long-term care. Where in long-term care, you know, the, for example, um, the physician comes to visit you in support of living, you go to visit the physician, or um, your medications are not covered, your furniture is not covered. So it's a different model of care. 
And so, yes, it's, it's done with intent from an organizational perspective. We're trying to move those clients out of long-term care, but we're still facing the challenge of, of dealing with who we have in long-term care and grandfathering those. How, sorry, how long has that process been going on? We're, we're starting to see with different um, uh, admission standards into long-term care uh, evidence that acuity is increasing, lengths of stay are shortening, particularly with uh, new admissions. And um, I was talking about that last night to you, too. I said our average length of stay is probably 18 months to two years in long-term care right now. Um, but if you take your admissions in the past year, the turnover is much greater. They're probably, we have centers where 50% of their, of their admissions in the past year have passed away already. So it's, um, we're seeing like a six month window sometimes, six to eight month window for length of stay for our new admissions in long term care. So it, the transition has, it's been in the works for, it depends on the jurisdiction, going back to our former zones. Right. 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 And it depends which locale it's been in place or been that work started many years ago in some locales and it's just starting to wrap up or move forward in some others. Okay. So it's hard for me to answer that one kind of from a provincial perspective. Uh, Trevor, Stephen, if uh, just to put a slightly different spin on that, um, we're always looking for ways that we can benchmark ourselves against other other jurisdictions. So when we look at, and I don't know if you have, but when you look at acuity in Ontario um, and the populations that, that are in long-term care in Ontario, uh, do we have a comparator um, or are there just too many differences? No, it's, it's, it's difficult to do that because uh, the, the data isn't, first of all, isn't necessarily publicly available. And... Uh, um, the the application of Vinterai, I mean, I, w we're talking about a very exemplar province here in Alberta who, who's leading the way. Um, certainly Ontario it does a great job about reporting uh, their long-term care, uh, um, not only their outcomes, but also their, their um, clinical data. Um, but these are really the only two provinces who, who, do, it, who do it on a systematic basis. Um, and And across the province, not just in specific regions. Mm -hmm. So uh, to try and do that uh, from a, uh, a scientific point of view is, is very difficult. Uh, but, but I do have actually one question for, for Eleanor, if I can, mm -hmm. if I can ask. Um, is there, you, you mentioned that there are now empty beds, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering if, if the AHS has a policy for what to do with those empty beds, given that... Um, <laughs> Long-term care capacity in Alberta is such a political issue. Um, I, do you close them? I mean, do you, what do you what do you do? Thanks for asking that. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's the hotbed right now, right? That, those are some of the unintended or the intended consequences of what we've been doing. But um, that, those are some of the discussions. And like our PCBF guru, Gordon Kramer, has said. You know, because the restaurant is half full, we don't fund the restaurant for those clients that are missing. Or, you know, you, we don't fund meals because people aren't filling the tables. Um, so there, it's controversy right now because we don't want to lose capacity in the event that this is just a blip. But as you saw in our funding model, there's also an, an, an accountability associated with occupancy. So some of our operators are saying, well, wait a minute, if you don't have anyone to send us, how... You know, we still got to operate, and we can't adjust our staffing. So those discussions are currently underway. Yeah, it's good. It's a, yeah, yeah. We're uh, we're drawing to the end of our time, but um, I'm uh, hopeful our panel might be able to stay around and ask uh, for questions if uh, anyone out there hasn't had a chance or opportunity to ask a question. Um, but thank you very much, and uh, good luck with the next session. Uh, the question I was going to ask was: you mentioned that. <coughs> that um, ultimately for the